everybody, it's Dr. Rick Tropimento, and hope everybody is having a great week, Wednesday. Um, for most people, it's hump day. For some of us, it's close to middle. Uh, we're moving forward. Uh, no matter what you're going through, no matter where you're at, no matter how far off the mark you feel you are, if you're still breathing, you are still in the fight. Uh, look, uh, another segment. Uh, I've been working on a lot of things, uh, including our, our new series, uh, Monday's Manly Mandates, which is a direct defense of black masculinity in specific and masculinity in general. Uh, it is a call to action and challenge to black men. It is also a defense against the all out assault on true masculinity. Uh, if you haven't checked it out, check it out. It's every Monday. Uh, we just dropped episode episode number two on uh, Monday. Also, on the 18th of this month, I will be hosting for the Sunrise Project, which is an own sponsored podcast, uh, which is actually uh, founded by... Uh, former client, uh, 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 corporate exec. Well, she owns her own business, so I guess she is the executive that she runs a mid-sized uh, PR firm. And she started this uh, because of some mental health issues. She started the Sunrise Project due to some mental health issues that her son was struggling with. And it has become uh, a juggernaut for parents, a place for parents to congregate. Well, there has been this ongoing discussion about there not being a safe space for black men to come together and have these tough conversations about life and about how we feel and about uh, our perceived inadequacies and so much. Well, they've given me the total uh, reins of the Sunrise Project. So on the 18th at 7 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time, I will be hosting uh, uh, Brothers Unfiltered which is where black men are invited to show up and in a no judgment, uh, uh, no holes barred conversation about how we feel. Uh, and nothing's off deck. This is a safe space, no ridicule, no judgment. Uh, and I'm excited about it because it's a national event and we are going to do this. And if it turns out to be something that we can record and quantify as successful, uh, it will open the door to continue to go on. We also, we already have some, um, some the attention of some people who could really truly touch this. And one of my challenges over the last, say, four or five years has been creating the resources to service a growing black male mental health issue a crisis and so this is real big for me because I've been fighting and I get absolutely no support and and I got to be careful saying that there's a couple of people who give literally a couple um, and it's nowhere close to what we need to do the things we do so I'm glad that things are starting over because I've been fighting and I've been pushing and I have refused to relent uh, I have dealt with generational trauma. I have lectured on it. I have create, created programs. I am implementing those programs. I have worked with families, communities. I currently work with the Harris County Sheriff's Office uh, dealing with childhood adverse experiences directly associated with incarcerated parents. And the re-entry program for the Harris County Sheriff's Office where we are dealing with uh, facilitating uh, the re-entry of inmates in a way that we can reduce recidivism which has been going an ongoing uh battle for me for more than 20 years so that's that now on the lighter note this bomb and i i, I have to switch uh up here and talk about this because i'm me still uh, i've spent years and years studying and becoming who i am as a voice uh in the area of psychology spirituality spirituality and overall trauma healing in the black community 
for years and I am proud of the work I do, but I'm also a black man and unapologetically black. And I stand and I defend what I have been designed to stand and defend. My first responsibility, even before being a provider, is being a protector. And so I'm going to stand up and I'm going to fight and defend. Sometimes I got to defend somebody I'm not necessarily happy with and agree with, but comes under unnecessary attack and assault. Um, then there's some that just absolutely don't deserve the ridicule they're getting. Uh, one of the things that's going on now is Jason Whitlock has always been a dude that just happens to have black skin. Jason doesn't have any desire whatsoever to truly connect with blacks and examine the true issues. He has been afforded a space where he can talk about stuff he absolutely has no knowledge of. He can form narratives and opinions and recite them as fact based on his bully pulpit of uh, the new media, the new social media, the new media, you know, where anybody can literally have a platform. And he's backed by m money people who like to hear what he says. And the, he's not the only one, Steve Harvey, there are a bunch of others who literally have built their wealth off of being counterintuitive to black progress and uh, avert be, while being averse to the celebration of true black brilliance. And Jason Whitlock is that person. Uh, anything that says strong black man, he's always had a problem with. And anything that says black dominance, he's always had a problem with. So athletics is probably not the place that Jason Whitlock should be, but he is. And so you constantly get this counter narrative of what's going on and what the vast majority of people, regardless of race, believe. Now, what you will learn about our white counterparts is they can know the truth, but will be more than happy to hear a counter narrative to the truth that makes them more comfortable. They can know that we're more athletic and that we're more gifted and all of these things. And this is just a simple thing. And don't think it's least because it's a physical attribute. It's historical in its development and presentation. It's their own behaviors in many instances coming back to haunt them. But don't marginalize our physical giftedness because that's what they've done to us. For years, they told us that uh, athletic quarterbacks couldn't play in the NFL because they didn't have the intellectual capacity or the brain power to function in the game. And now uh, those type of quarterbacks are dominating the NFL and uh, all but maybe one of them are black or biracial. And I come from an era where if your daddy black, you're black. And that's all it is to it. So all of them are black. But something Chubby said uh, after Iowa beat uh, LSU in the uh, Elite Eight to go to the Final Four. And that was, to me, a good game. I think it was a poorly coached game by Kim Malky. Uh, I think um, Haley Van Lith was a deer in headlights trying to guard um, uh, Caitlin Clark. And I think that the first thing I would have done is I would have put uh, Flo J. Uh, Johnson on her, more athletic, more skilled, uh, more confidence. Uh, and I would have, and she would have made. Uh, Caitlin played defense on the other end, which um, Haley did not. But it was it was time management, it was scheming, it was a pure mess on Kim Mockett's part. Uh, not taking anything away from Iowa's play because their whole team stepped up. Yes, Caitlin had 41 points and her buckets were timely and her buckets were huge. But there were some other big baskets made. Um, and 
they end up only winning by, I think, five or six or something like that points. They closed the gap at the end once Flo Janae actually started um, guarding her and, and, and a bunch of other things. I'm not saying they would have won either way. I, I, I don't predict those things, but I'm saying that I think it was our coach. But I don't want to take anything away from Iowa. I don't want to take anything away from Clayton and Clark. Um, Actually, the young lady at show class, you know, yes, she was taunting last year and she admits she was taunting. So when it came back on her in the championship game and Angel taunted her and everybody, you know, especially the other side made a real big issue about it. They weren't worried about the taunting when she was doing it. But when she got taunted after losing, they did. She came on and said, hey, that's part of the game. She's a noise talker. That's the way she plays the game. And when it came back on her, she says, the way you stop it is win. She came back this year and she won. Uh, and then with class, she hugged her and they talked. And uh, Angel has been saying the whole time, we don't hate each other. We're competitors. And that's what you got out there. You got female gladiators going at it, at it in a sport uh, that a lot of people are getting rich off of and a lot of people are doing whatever. But at least these players are getting paid now. So that's good. But Jason little chubby ass had something to say he said that he's glad it's over now we can stop the crap and stop comparing angel reese to caitlin clark they're not even in the same arena some other bull crap the only reason angel reese is famous is for taunting now, anybody who understands and knows the sport and knows the history of the game and has watched Angel since she was in Baltimore and then when she was at, uh, what's the school she was at before she came there? But she came to LSU with, uh, with a uh, resume uh, and she's a walking double-double. She had 20 rebounds Monday night. So, and I think 17 points. So she had another double-double. Is her skill set the same as Caitlin Clark? No, nobody's skill set the same as Caitlin Clark. Nobody's ever said that. What we said were we had competitors and we were looking at a team because we understand not one person is gonna win the game. But, and my, and my actual strategy was, you got two ways to do this, you can, literally double her all game long and not even let her touch the ball and make the other team beat you or you sit up and you stick to your man and you let her go to work if she outscores you by herself but what she makes you do is break she breaks down your defense not just with her dribbling and penetration but with her shooting she makes other players want to break off and come help the player that's getting torched and ultimately leave other players open and she finds them with pinpoint accuracy. Uh, they got beat down the court a lot, but ultimately nobody said that Angel is the same or equal in the same way that, but Angel has an impact on the game. Angel's leadership is equal um, on the floor. She's more emotional, she's more erratic, she's more volatile, that's the way she plays the game and it's a direct relationship to where she grew up playing the game. Caitlin grew up in a barn in our literally shooting by herself and had to play with boys because that wasn't a girl's team. A lot of her game is explained by that. Angel grew up in Baltimore. And if you don't understand, just start researching the city of Baltimore and you'll understand the hardships, the difficulties, and the edge that she has. Um, and the idea that that young lady is only famous because of that tonic. No, she's famous because she was a walking double-double last year. She's famous because she showed up and she led that team to that championship. Uh, we watched Flo J grow up this year uh, and become a scoring machine and skill set. She's going to she's going to be a problem uh, next year as a junior. But here's the thing: Whitlock didn't have to say that, but Whitlock knows his viewers want to hear it because to them, every white person in the Midwest won when Iowa won because it was that big to them. And let's be honest, we were cheering for L LSU, even if we're not LSU fans. 
and we, we were cheering for them because we sensed the hostility against our girls. I, I don't see anything wrong with that. I don't think we need to take it outside of the game, though. I think in the game, you sit up and say, I'm right with my... Now, when you come for my girl, after the game is over, your people won. Let it ride. You know, I mean, and you know, say, hey, man, say what you want to say. Caitlin took it to him because she did. Nobody can rob her from that. And I'm not about robbing athletes based on any situation outside of a sport. When I'm playing in a sport or observing a sport, I'm watching the pure performance of the athlete and I'm enjoying the game. I'm enjoying the track meet. I'm enjoying the swim meet. I'm enjoying the athleticism and the skill and the the mentality it takes to compete at a high level. I'm looking at the pressure that's on people like Juju uh, Watkins as a freshman who had to come down and play our heart out to only lose uh, to um, a, a UConn team that's sweet and, and, the, and, and to watch their star who happens to be white come back from a horrifying knee injury last year to play at the level she played at uh, to watch Hannah uh, Hidalgo, little freshman at Notre Dame, ball out of control that's the kind of stuff I love and I've watched women's, basket, women's basketball elevate over the last few years to where we're paying attention to it and I'm getting I'm feeling that, I'm feeling that and everything is worth 